Welcome back to the channel, I'm Damo. I'm Nick. And today we're going to be taking a look at Football Offences Explained. So we've been really enjoying doing these and we think that you've been really enjoying them as well is a collection of videos we've kind of been going through trying to learn and understand the sport of American football in more detail, in greater detail. We, we've absolutely loved these. It's given us such a perspective on the sport that we just didn't have and we're yeah. starting to see that now on the other sports, although we're a bit further behind on those. So yeah, this is the eighth that we've done, I think, and hopefully you've enjoyed them enough that you're going to be happy to hear that there's going to be another eight coming. So They're thinking, God, please. Yeah. No. <laughs> I was going to stick with you for the eight. You're lucky we're <laughs> even still here for the eight. But yeah, no, we've, we've loved it that much. That we've gone. It's, it's obviously tricky to do this because we want everything that we do to be a first-time reaction. But what we've done is we've gone through and we've kind of picked out eight videos that we think are a little bit more intricate than the eight we've looked at already yeah. that are in the playlist. By the way, if you haven't seen the playlist, please go back and watch it through. Uh, if you've seen it already, watch it again. Don't know why. Just, <laughs> just watch it again. Just leave it on repeat. Yeah, just put it on repeat. Um, but yeah, so we, we've kind of looked, we've had to base this off of obviously video titles and thumbnails. So we hope it's going to go as well as we expect it to. Yeah. But yeah, we're another eight coming. But yeah, in the meantime, this is Football Offences Explained and we hope you enjoy it. All right, in this video, we're going to show you the different types of football offenses that you may see on a Friday night, a Saturday, or even a Sunday when the NFL plays. Now, this is only a part one to what we hope to do a part two of all the offenses that are in football, but we wanted to show the main type of offenses and how they evolved from the beginning of football until what you see now, okay? So we're gonna cover five different types of offenses. The single wing, the triple option, the run and shoot, the West Coast, and the air raid offense. So we're gonna show you the founders of the offense and how it evolved to, uh, to what you see today. You ever heard of any of them? Um, no, not in the context of football. No, 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 of course. I'd imagine you've heard of the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. Now, the beautiful right. thing about football is the evolution and the innovation that occurs from team to team. So if you're watching this right now and you don't exactly run that type of formation or that type of system, but you run a shell of it, let us know in the comment section below because we want to know how you've taken this offense and evolved it into your own. Or maybe your coach has evolved it into his own. Now getting started with our first offense, which is the single wing. So this offense, it's still used by high school coaches today. We don't see too many colleges or NFL uh, teams running this formation, but it's mostly high school teams that run this formation. Now the single wing was one of the first formations and offenses that was ever invented. If you remember back in the 19, early 1900s, uh, they would direct snap it to what they called a tailback and they would just try to ram it down the defense's throat and it was a very physical smash mouth game as they drove it down their throats. It wasn't until Glenn Scobie Pop Warner, yes, that Pop Warner who the league is named after, who was possibly one of the greatest innovators to the game of football, took this formation and put what he called a spinner in, which was now more misdirections, players going left, players going right, and he would have his tailback, which they called in that day a spinner, spin around and fake and fake and sometimes keep the ball himself to cause confusion for the defense. So it wasn't so much catch and smash it down your throat anymore. It was more of catch, fake, fake, and try to get guys in the open uh, by using the fakes. This is what we see commonly for the single wing now is we see this fake, fake guard pull, running power, counter, so on and so forth. Now this offense differs from other offenses because it's more of a, uh, a downhill running type of offense where they're not going to air the ball out 20 to 30 to 40 times a game. It's more to confuse the defense and to get their running backs into space by faking one way and then going misdirection. Now some of the innovations that we've... I suppose up to now the most faking that we've probably seen has been the Fiesta Bowl, yeah. 2007, where yep. Boise State overcome Oklahoma. Yes, that, that was the Statue of Liberty play. That was, yeah, finishing the, the Statue end, yeah. of Liberty play. Yeah, exactly. For those of those, there's a lot of comments after the Statue of Liberty play. We did go back and watch it. It was because of, I got so caught up in the fact I nearly had the correct score for that that I was <laughs> yeah. just missing things all over the place. But I did see it, and yeah, we did yeah. go back and watch. Incredible, Incredible. play. Yeah. with the single wing, it started in the early 1900s, and then colleges started to pick it up. We see a Notre Dame box variation where they were able to put what looks like essentially a box on one side of their formation and then be able to take the ball and run that way. More common variations are the unbalanced wing as well as the 
Yale single wing, which had three players. One What's, what, what is, what are TB and HB? Uh, I know you've got, you got uh, fullback, quarterback, fullback, tight uh, ends. I, I get all of them except half, for halfback. That makes sense, and obviously tailback. But what what is a tailback now? Is that what your running back is now? Uh, I would assume so. Running back's always behind the quarterback. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. One side of the formation, but essentially what this Starts offense is trying to do is to run mm. the football efficiently, chew clock, and be able to control the tempo of the game. And again, that offense is slowly starting to die out a little bit. There are some high schools and, and a dedicated group that still run the single wing, and it still is an effective offense, but we don't see it as much at the college and the uh, NFL level. Now, evolving from the single wing offense, we have what we call the triple option offense, and we still do see the triple option offense in today's game, Okay, whether it be high school, uh, youth with Pop Warner, college, or even Sometimes we see it in the NFL a different variation, which we're going to cover. But this offense is essentially making one person wrong, okay? And the reason they call it triple option is because the quarterback typically has three options. One, he can give it to the fullback. Two, he can keep it himself. Three, he can pitch the ball to another player. Now, the triple option was designed to put the defense in conflict, okay? And the triple option served as a base to what we see in the spread game today. So essentially what the triple option is, is the quarterback's going to put the ball in the belly of the fullback. If the defensive end crashes down on the fullback, he's going to pull it out and he's going to run. Now he's reading the outside linebacker. If the outside linebacker crashes to him, he's going to pitch it out. Okay. So there's the three different layers of options that the quarterback has, thus the triple option. Now the triple option was first seen in 1941 by the Missouri head coach Don Farratt. And he was the first one that we've seen run this triple option style where he just used the fullback and then he had an underhand pitch, not necessarily the overhand pitch that we see in today's game, but the underhand pitch to another player. It wasn't until 1965 where Billy Yeoman introduced the split veer with his Houston team that essentially had two guys in the backfield where he would run a straight dive with the fullback and then use his triple option to pitch the ball out to another player. This split veer was wildly popular for Houston as they were able to dominate most of the 60s. Now, towards the end of the 60s, around 1968, Emery Bellard comes through and creates what's called the wishbone. Okay, and this is for the Texas Longhorns, and the Texas Longhorns dominated most of the early 70s and the late 60s by using this wishbone offense. Again, it was a three... Happy with it so far? Yeah, I think if I've got any confusion at the moment, it's where are the wide receivers? But then I don't know if that's just a terminology thing, because I, and I don't know if that's because in these plays they're trying to run the ball. So is that just yeah. in the setup? You, there is no effective wide receiver because we're looking to run the ball, and because on on one of the shots earlier there were two running backs. Yeah, so the uh, triple option. I mean, even before it came up, I thought yeah. it's going to give the quarterback three well, options. That's yeah, the, to back run himself, and two pass backs. it to the running back. Yeah, or, or, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not sure where the running backs are, but I think you might be right. No, it's the wide receivers. Yeah, I've got the running yeah, yeah. backs. Sorry, yeah, wide yeah, it's just yeah. the wide receivers. But yeah, I just wonder if it's because in these particular attacking plays, have I got it, this right or am I way off course here? Yeah. But yeah, is it because in this particular play it appears they're trying to run the ball? And yeah, hopefully that's why. The back yeah. offense that was constructed mostly like a wishbone, that's where it gets its name from, and he would have the ability to run his fullback dives as well as the triple option. And this became a staple uh, for more of the, most of the powerhouse college programs. Now, Emery Bellard runs it, 1969, Barry Switzer, yes, from Oklahoma, picks it up, and he starts to dominate teams with this triple option attack. So we have Texas running it, we have Oklahoma running it, and these teams are just straight out killing other teams because no one can stop this triple option attack that is so hard to defend because it takes discipline and it takes players doing exactly what they're supposed to do because if one player loses discipline on the fullback dive, on the quarterback, or even on the pitch, Everything goes haywire, and then that's how big yards are gained. Now, fast forward to 1981. Tom Osborne and the Nebraska offense start to pummel teams with this triple option combined with their eye formation power attack. So now you didn't know what to get. So now players were getting kicked out on power, 
or they were being optioned, okay? So defensive ends were put in this weird, weird situation where do I squeeze down? Do I stay where I am? Coaches really had to plan for this, and that's why Tom Osborne, with his wishbone offense combined with his eye power style of running the football, was able to dominate most of the 80s with this triple option power style of attack. Now, just another year later in 1982, Fisher DeBerry innovates the offense even more. He sees what we see for the first time as the flex bone offense. So it's essentially a triple option offense, but the wings, instead of being in the backfield, are now split out to the tackles. And if uh, Coach DeBerry was the Air Force head coach, if you watch any Air Force game, even present day, you'll see a variation of the flex bone where they have those two wing backs on the tackles as well as the fullback in the backfield. So this is where the offense start to innovate and coaches start to get more creative using motion to get the player with triple option involved, toss sweeps, uh, fullback dives, and so on. Now this next part is where the triple option saw its biggest innovation that we've ever seen in the game and it's still running true 20 years later. 1999, this coach named Rich Rodriguez from Glenville State innovates this offense which he calls the spread offense but by accident one day he finds this play and calls it the read option and the story goes like this one afternoon glenville starting quarterback drenning bobbled a snap and on one of these zone blocking plays was unable to hand the ball off to the running back drenning tucked the ball himself and saw the backside defensive end crashing down the line of scrimmage to tackle the running back who in fact did not have the ball after the whistle rodriguez asked Drenning the quarterback why did you do that why did you run that way and he said straight up the end pinched okay and thus Rich Rodriguez had this idea I'm gonna put the ball in the belly of the running back and then once he goes downhill I'm gonna pull it and then the read options born now coaches are taking that flex bone style that wishbone style of triple option and they're using it from a two by two spread game where they're able to take the football put it in the belly of the running back and have another player get involved in the triple option. This was one of the biggest revelations that we've seen in football as far as spreading the ball around the field and using the triple option basics, combine it with the spread option. Yeah, we've seen that quite a few times, haven't we? I was going to say, we've seen, yeah, them, the fake handoff to the running yeah. back and, that, yeah, yeah. and then the quarterback obviously runs. Obviously a very successful play. Definitely. Um, yeah, whether he runs himself or, or goes for the goes for the throw after that. But, it, I mean, it's sent we've been confused multiple times about where the ball is even the cameraman at times yeah. as well can't follow it so yeah. it's obviously very very successful and I could be really I could be getting this completely wrong now but I'm wondering if this is an evolution of the attacking options as we're going through this video maybe that's why there were no wide receivers because there was a wide end I think it was in that last play but yeah, not right to be honest, yeah. uh, I mean I don't know some of the footage I'm not going to say with any arrogance or cockiness because no, no. I really am no. unsure uh, but. but obviously there's a lot of terminology here that is still yeah, it's still, well, yeah, time, I mean, yeah. I mean, the fundamentals, I think, yeah. again. Cause, Three months ago, I literally knew nothing yeah. in life, not even just about this. <laughs> <laughs> and thus, the innovation of the RPO, which we'll talk about, and the triple option essentially married itself to create what we have as the read option. The next offense that we're going to talk about is the run and shoot, which eventually evolved into the spread offense. Now, the run and shoot is extremely interesting. It got its start by a name of Tiger Ellison, okay, Glenn Tiger Ellison. He was a high school football coach who was looking to innovate the game in a certain way because his teams weren't doing too well. So one day he's walking by a park and he sees a bunch of kids playing football, normally as you know me or you would when we were a kid running around. And we saw as the kids weren't handing the football off, they were throwing it. Every single play, throwing it, throwing it, throwing it. So the story goes that Tiger Ellison's team is 0-4-1. And, and as he's coaching at Middletown, Ohio. And he's on the, the brink of the first losing season in his school's history, dating back to 1911. So what he does is he puts in this innovative offense called the Lonesome Polk 11. So what he... There's no way anyone managed to read that inside. <laughs> I'm still on the third line. Oh, four and one. Does that mean they had draws? Yeah, I'm wondering if that was a draw. Yeah. So it's, four losses and maybe a draw in the yeah. end. Yeah. When did if that was the case? When did when did the overtime come into the game? Mm. Okay. What he does is he puts in this innovative offense called the Lonesome Polecat, which is actually a lot similar to what we see nowadays as a swinging gate, where you put everybody like over here system. and you only have a center <laughs> and a quarterback or a center quarterback running back right directly behind the football. 
So Coach was able to score points, points this way by catching the football and having different options to throw the football based on what the defense gave him. Now, the kids started to have a blast with this because they were throwing the ball over the field. So Tiger got this idea, okay, what if I snap the football in a regular formation, spread some guys out, and then have them dictate the routes and where I throw the football. Now, this was the base foundation of what the run and shoot was and eventually how the spread offense came to be. Now, Coach Mouse Davis took this concept from, that he got from Tiger Ellison and made it into his own thing, into what we see as the run and shoot today. Now, the run and shoot is an offense that's really hard to stop because it's all based off of receiver routes based on what the defense gives them. So, for instance, if a coach calls a play and just labels it a choice route, now the receiver has the choice to run his route based off of the defense alignment and what the coverage is. So Coach Davis was able to take this concept and put it into a spread system with four receivers, five receivers, and absolutely torch defenses with this concept. The run and shoot is still widely used today as an offense where the quarterback and the wide receiver have to be on the same page, but it essentially takes advantage of space that the defense is giving to the offense. If they're playing in zone coverages, receivers are simply just going to sit in the open spot and wait for the football. It's an offense that doesn't take big, strong players. It takes athletic, smart players to be able to feel the defense and to put themselves in the right position. That way the quarterback can deliver the ball. Now the next offense that we're going to look at is the West Coast offense. And this word is thrown around all over the NFL, uh, whether it be talking about John Gruden, Andy Reid, uh, Mike McCarthy, all these guys that stem from the Bill Walsh coaching tree. The West Coast offense is a really big buzzword, but what exactly does the West Coast offense mean? So let's start where the West Coast first got its name from. So of course it resonates from former San Francisco head coach Bill Walsh, but Bill Walsh actually got his start from when Bill coached in Cincinnati. Now, the story is that Greg Cook was Bill Walsh's quarterback in Cincinnati, six foot four, 200 pounds, had a real strong arm, uh, he had five touchdowns through five games. However, Greg ended up getting hurt. So they had to go with their backup quarterback named Virgil Carter. Didn't have a strong arm. However, was very mobile and was very accurate underneath. So Bill had to do something to create situations for Virgil to succeed. So what Coach Walsh did was he established a horizontal passing attack. Okay, So instead of stretching the ball downfield and throwing it as deep as they could, he wants to stretch it out horizontally, meaning shorter passes, okay, and stretch the defense to follow guys in crossing patterns and short to intermediate throwing routes, okay? So if you look at the offense's basics, you look at, it essentially is a long handoff that they're doing between getting the ball out to the flat, okay, or getting the ball out to an underneath receiver. These horizontal throws allow for high percentage completions and run after the catch. That's why if you look at older clips with Jerry Rice catching the football, He's usually catching it, and then his run after the catch is usually 20 to 30 yards, where he gained. We really have to do Jerry Rice. Yes. It keeps yeah. on coming up. <laughs> it does. Apparently, he's widely regarded as potentially the greatest ever player. So, okay. another one. Obviously, yeah. there's so many players that seem to be in that mix. Yeah, the of majority course. of his yards. Now, Coach Walsh took this to San Francisco, where it was obviously dubbed the West Coast offense, and his quarterback, Joe Montana, and of course, Jerry Rice thrived in this system. Because Joe Coach Walsh yeah. developed a system where everything was based off of footwork, okay? Three steps, three steps and a hitch, five steps, five steps, no hitch, let it go, seven steps and a hitch. All of his offense had rhythmic cadence to it where the quarterback hit his drop and then deliver the football on time. So that's why when you see Jerry Rice and these guys hit these big plays off the West Coast offense, it was usually Joe Montana taking his drop. By the time he got his back foot in the ground on a hitch or a plant step, that ball was ready to be delivered based on the coverage that was shown. Now, another thing about the West Coast offense is that it's extremely flexible in its play calls, and it usually has a super long name to it. Uh, just to give you an example, strong right, slot Z right, spider two, Y banana, Z over. All right, that may seem like a foreign language to all of us, but essentially it gives the coach the flexibility to change any piece in that offense to what he wants it to be. Now, NFL coaches like Andy Reid were able to take this offensive concept of horizontal stretching and still use it in today's spread game. And that's where we see the innovation come from. Coach Walsh's formation were mainly two back, okay, whether it be split back, I formation, 
and he was using that fullback and running back into the flat. We do see a little bit of this with Coach Andy Reid using uh, fullback Anthony Sherman to get into routes, but a lot of what he's doing nowadays is from a spread look, short underneath passes, and he has guys like Tyree Kill, Miko Hardman, who are faster, that can get the run after the catch and produce big yards. But this is the basics of the West Coast offense, is stretching the field horizontally. That way they can get their playmakers the football essentially the fastest way possible with a high percentage chance to catch the football and then be able to get upfield. Now our last formation... Going about what you said on um, the evolution, it seems to be, uh, you might be correct, because these last two are definitely ones we're more familiar with. Yeah, um, 100%. Yeah, yeah, they've definitely made a lot more sense. Yeah, the ones from potentially back in the day were... Yeah. It was just more the position names, to be honest, yeah, exactly. out of everything. But yeah. yeah, this this makes a lot more sense. I'll be honest. Early on in this video, I was thinking that maybe this should have gone into season two. Yeah, yeah. Say, yeah. You're not, you're not, you're not alone there, mate. But, but um, yeah, the last two definitely way yeah. more familiar from what we've seen. Um, Agreed. Since we started the channel, yeah. definitely. Is the air raid offense now? The air raid offense is another popular buzzword that a lot of teams use, and this is one of the most common offenses found in high schools as well as colleges and it's starting to leak into the nfl as well where the name is exactly how the offense is played it's air raid okay they're trying to throw the ball 30 40 sometimes 50 times a game and essentially what they're trying to do is take advantage of what the defense is giving them now the air raid originates when hal mummy and mike leach were coaching together at university of kentucky and they went down to florida to a coach's clinic and they saw a coach running a two-minute drill and they both looked at each other and said, why can't we run that two-minute drill always? Okay, because teams are so used to huddling up, running a play, huddling up, running a play. And no one really innovated yet of just going as fast as they possibly can to keep the defense on their heels. Now, what does speed for an offense do to a defense? It keeps the players on the field, okay? So if they get tired, they have no choice but to stay on the field unless they call a timeout or they're running players back and forth, which usually doesn't happen too often. Okay, so this quick aerial attack kept the defensive backs tired as well because they got to chase receivers all across the field. So Coach Leach and Coach Mummy decided, how can we make this as fast as possible, throwing the ball down the field? So they created a simplistic system where they have short play calls as opposed to what we just saw on the West Coast that has a very long play call. Air Raid has short play calls. For example, a play call would be early 92 and everyone knew what they were doing and they could throw tags onto the play if they needed to. But that simplistic style of play call allowed offenses to play fast because they didn't need to think too much. They could just get on the football and then run it as fast as they possibly can. Now the good side of running the air raid is obviously you score a lot of points quickly because you're able to push the ball downfield to a tired defense as fast as you possibly can and get your playmakers in space. And that was the concept of the air raid was why be in this tight formation and try to pound it down the opponent's throat when we have athletes we have speed let's spread the ball out and have our quarterback make good decisions and get the ball downfield so air raid teams typically score a lot of points and are ringing up the scoreboard the downside to scoring a lot of points fast is your defense now is on the field longer so your offense may have a, a 40 yeah. to yeah. minute drive and then the defense got to come back on the field for three minutes now if the offense goes quickly in 20 seconds, the defense has to come back on the field. So a lot of times where if offenses even go three and out, the defense is back on the field. So uh, this is one of the downsides to running the air raid, but it's extremely popular because of the point potential that offenses can put up by simply getting their athletes the football in space. So those are the five different offenses that we're going to cover in this video. Yep. Yeah, yeah, all good. To be fair, I think that gives a bit that gives a clearer understanding about why certain plays are run. Definitely. Also, really interesting what you said about the ends. I never really considered that about if you do just keep scoring, then it is yeah. your defense coming it's back onto the one. field. Yeah. yeah, hadn't really considered that. It was right. kind of like a eureka moment when I thought about why I was expecting people to make all these risky passes, like seen in rugby, but then I realised yeah. just how important think, yeah, possession it, is yeah, in uh, American football. It's still normal for us to have for our one team to be on the pitch um, in, yeah, in, in, in yeah. soccer uh, for the whole whole 90 minutes. But yeah, it does make a lot of sense. And yeah. like you, like we said, um, as the plays went on, it's like it sort of clicked everyone. Definitely. Um, Definitely. The, especially the third, fourth and fifth one, I think we're more familiar with those yeah. three. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was uh, that was really good. A nice way to end that little bulk of eight videos that we've had. Yeah. They are all up in a playlist. We have got them. So if you've seen maybe a couple of them or you have been watching through but you want to watch them in one go, do go dig out the playlist and give them a watch. Um, 
even if you don't want to watch them, just go there, stick it on mute, just yeah. let it run. Just go about your day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go about your day, whatever you're doing. Yeah. That'd be much appreciated. But yeah, we, we will be coming back with a season two of this. So eight more videos have been picked out. It's just based on thumbnail and title. So fingers crossed they all go nicely together. But let us know if it is something that you want to see. Definitely. Thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to like, subscribe and share. It really helps to grow the channel. We'll see you on the next one.